And when I realized that I was back in my body, so to speak, I thought there must be some sort of meaning that I should live in this world again. So maybe I should make myself noticed, but I couldn't make myself noticed. I didn't have a voice, I couldn't move. I was looking for something and couldn't find anything after trying three times. I already wanted to give up, but I thought, there must be a meaning behind this. Then I saw that there was a tag hanging on my toe. It was wrapped around my toe with a thread. And the tag said, Josef Atzmüller died on 20th of December at 8 p.m. Mr. Atzmüller, in 1964, you were 16 years old at the time, you were declared dead in hospital after suffering from a ruptured appendix. These experiences were dramatic and have had a profound influence on your life. These events are still memorable for you today because you also had a near-death experience at the time. Would you tell us how it came to those events, please? Well, the way it came to that, I went to a technical secondary school at the time. I'd gone to school and suffered from abdominal pains there. It happened in the technical secondary school, Harte L, in St. Pulten. I went to see a doctor and he prescribed me with some medication. I took it and subsequently went to school. And all of a sudden, the pain was gone, completely gone. I was wondering how it had disappeared so quickly, but I didn't think of it much. But something strange happened the day after. It was a Saturday, and I went to the school's canteen to buy some milk. It was strange because I never drank any milk. Well, I drank this cold milk and went home from school at midday, meaning I took a train to milk and a bus to Heiligenblut, which is in the southern Waldviertel in Lower Austria. But my mother didn't like the look of me. She asked me, is there something wrong with you? I answered, no, what should be wrong? Maybe I've caught a bit of a cold or something along those lines. And on Monday morning, my mother said something she would have never said, not even after this event. She said, you can't go to school, you'll have to stay at home. So she felt something was wrong. Exactly. She felt something was wrong. She called the doctor. He examined me and said, well, it's a stomach bug. My mother didn't like this diagnosis at all. She got more and more nervous and finally the doctor said, okay, let's bring him to hospital for observation. And eventually I was sent to hospital by ambulance. My mother accompanied me. During the hospitalization, Deputy Chief Physician Peters was present. He examined me and fell silent. After a while, he said, it's a ruptured appendix and peritonitis. There's no chance of survival. He said this in front of you? Yes, he said this in front of me. However, today I recall that my mother was even more shocked than me. Maybe in that sense, it was a good distraction for me that my mother had come with me. And after a while, Deputy Chief Physician Peters said he'd have a request. He would like to do a surgery on me, not because he thought I'd have a chance to survive, but because there was this new synthetic mesh where you could cut intestines into pieces, so to speak. And he would like to try that on me. Of course, my mother agreed to it. And so I went straight into the operating theatre. But I can't tell you anything about the surgery. These events happened all on the same day? Yes, they happened immediately, within the following hours. And what are your next memories? My memories only came back when I could hear something. That's when I woke up again. I realized it was dark and I was lying in a room with some other roommates. 
And actually, somebody opened the door and something very strange happened. It was strange to me because a nurse entered. I was lying next to the door and she came to me and asked, is Atzmüller still alive? Maybe it was a change of shifts or whatever. I just couldn't understand how anybody could ask such a question until today. She was also frightened when I said, yes, that's me. I estimate that happened at around 4 a.m. Then, breakfast was served a few hours later. Everybody gets something except for me. Hello, this can't be real. I want to get something too. I was begging for some food. And eventually, I got a cup of tea and a bun, a white bread roll. I took a sip of my tea and I wanted to take a bite of the bun, but I didn't get that far because the door was opened and Deputy Chief Physician Peters entered and started yelling awfully loudly. I always have to tell people about this, maybe because I've never heard a person yell like that ever again. I wasn't supposed to get any food. And the surgery went surprisingly well. Well, I didn't find out. My questions regarding this weren't answered. Only in the course of the afternoon, a doctor came by, an assistant doctor. He was the son of our GP, Dr. Turney. And he told me, well, we can't understand this. We opened up your abdominal wall and it was that inflamed we could barely clean it. So we couldn't really do anything. We had to sew you up again in the same condition. I don't even know. I, I can't really tell you whether I was shocked by this information. I just knew that I didn't want to lie in bed and wait for my death. That's something I didn't want in any case. I wanted to get up so badly. It was very difficult and so on. And that's when I made an interesting experience for myself. It's possible to have such intense pains that you faint. That's something I experienced a few times in the following days. People were wondering why I wasn't dying. Almost about a week later, they sent me back to the operating theater. They thought their diagnosis had been completely wrong. Since is not dying, let's take another look. But during the surgery, they still came to the same conclusion. And gradually, I got worse and worse. Then there came a time when I couldn't get up anymore. It was also very painful for me that my mother came to visit me in hospital every day. It wasn't because I didn't get along with her, the opposite was the case. We got along wonderfully. We even understood each other blindly, without having to say a word. But I had four siblings, and my mother was home alone and had to look after my siblings as well. And it required quite some time to come to milk by public transport and go back in the evening. And the nurses told me, your mother is staying in hospital all day. When she wasn't allowed to see me, she actually was only allowed to see me a few minutes at a time, she was praying in the hospital chapel. She wanted me to survive so badly. And for you, it was a death struggle that lasted for several days. Weeks. Yes, but I didn't want my mother sacrificing herself for me. I didn't want that at all. Well, in the end, the day came. On the 19th of December, my parents were contacted that I probably wouldn't survive another day. And on the 20th of December, my parents came in. Father wore a brand new suit, and also mother was especially smartened up, I'd also like to call it. Well, and mother came towards me, greeted me, and gave me a kiss on the cheek. Father just stayed next to the bed. I was thinking, hello, what's going on? Why isn't he coming closer? 
and I tried to speak to him, but he didn't react to me. Then I realized that I was unconscious to my parents. However, I was able to sense and hear them. So, from your parents' point of view, you were not responsive? Yes, from my parents' point of view, I wasn't responsive. My father's brother, Uncle Emmerich, was involved in building the motorway A1. During his visit, he said that they were building a section of the motorway near Melk. He was also a visitor and he said that a section had to be disassembled. The section was a whole kilometer long and they had to rebuild the foundation again, and so forth and so on, because the motorway wasn't in order. And years later, I told him what he had said on that day, and he didn't want to believe it. Nobody knows about this, and I said, of course you did, you said it when you came to visit me in hospital. And that was one situation where I could prove that I'd been able to hear them. So there had been several visitors who experienced you as being unconscious? Yes, all of them experienced me as being unconscious. But you were aware of what they were saying? Yes, I was able to. I'm sure I wasn't aware of everything, but I still picked up quite a lot. Well, and many things were quite strange to me, like the topics they were talking about. They looked for topics of conversation that didn't have anything to do with death or me. People just talked about anything, and that was a strange situation. How did you experience this last day? Were you still connected to your body and the severe pains? Yes, I was still connected to the pains, although I had also received morphine. Yes, that's something I should mention. Of course, that helped. However, there was a moment that changed everything because two altar boys and a priest came in and they lit a candle. And since I had been an altar boy too, this wasn't anything new to me. I just felt this need to confess one more time, to confess all the things I'd done and hadn't regretted, or something along those lines. And I also wanted to tell the priest these things and resolve them. And I completely forgot that for the priest, I was completely unconscious. Later on, I saw how people react when they are unconscious and a priest is present. Well, I was able to understand it then. The priest became faster and faster when he was administering the sacraments. At the time, it was called having your last rites, your last provision or extreme unction. These were the terms for it and he went increasingly faster. Actually, I've got to say, I was quite furious. I was really angry that he was just doing his job. And it was baffling that after the priest had left, the pains didn't have any meaning anymore, no meaning whatsoever. Yes, I've got to say that somehow I accredit it to the sacraments, that apparently you get to a state where suffering isn't really meaningful anymore. And how did this so-called near-death experience come about then? Well, it was like that. It was already quite late when the priest came to visit me, and I still hadn't died yet. That was at around 6 p.m. At that time, relatives and acquaintances who had come began to say their farewells. Actually, quite a few people had come. My parents were the last ones who left, but I hadn't died yet. Then they put me into a single room. Later, I was told it was also the custom to leave the dying by themselves. And for me, this moment of being by myself is something I'd like to talk about now. Because for me, 
This transition from this life to the eternal life is something like a process of reconciliation, a complete process of reconciliation. And this was something that occupied me because I wanted to tell people who'd done me wrong, don't worry about it anymore. Everything's settled and forgiven. Yes, don't worry about it. But then I went through this phase where I also would have liked to ask for forgiveness. This was harder because I couldn't talk to anyone, I couldn't ask for forgiveness anymore. And I felt that I could be present with my family, my siblings, my parents. And there was this silence, not a word was spoken, and there was this unbelievable sadness. And this sadness burdened me a lot. If I felt, well, okay, he'd already had to pass from us, but maybe there's a life after death, or maybe we'll be able to see each other again. If there had been any glimmer of hope, it wouldn't have been so burdensome for me. My wish, actually my inner desire, was that they could be happy. Yes, of course, it was clear to me that this wasn't possible because in the end, I had the feeling that I was going home. That's why they should be happy. Because everybody's allowed to go home at one point. But of course, you don't want to let go of a person you love. That's natural. You mentioned being present with your family. Did you mean that you were present with your feelings or that you were actually present with your senses as well? I had the feeling I was present with my senses, yes. For example, I tried to put my hand on my mother's shoulder, but there was no reaction, you see. Of course, for my mother, the world had crashed. I'd been the eldest child and I'd been the most important contact person to her and she'd lost me now. It was pretty clear to me that, for my mother, it was the hardest. Were you able to resolve things where you thought they were still open and needed to be resolved? That just wasn't possible anymore. It was a burden, certainly, but it just wasn't possible anymore. Observed from the outside, your long way of suffering ended when you were declared dead. But for yourself, life continued. Yes, I never perceived myself as being dead. Yes, I was declared dead, but in my memory this hardly exists. Because I realized that after I had left my family, I also left my body. I'd like to try and describe this in a bit. It's like the whole universe would fall apart, collapse, all stars fall from the sky, everything dissolves, and you end up in complete darkness, so to speak. When I'm talking about complete darkness, then I'm not talking about the kind of darkness we know of. But there's just nothing, not a spark of light, no sound, just nothing. Before we start talking about this nothingness, did you experience the exit of your body at a certain spot of your body? Yes, I did exit my body. Well, upwards, yes. And then the big nothingness came. Yes, then this collapse came. Everything has an ending. You step into another form of time. Our time, in which we live in, I'd say, well, also isn't so palpable either because everybody experiences it in a different way. You know yourself, when you drive somewhere, the way there takes a lot longer. It doesn't take longer, it's just that we process new information. And that takes longer than the way back. The way back is shorter most of the time. Time is something that's relative. So time didn't exist at that moment anymore. It was different, completely different. In this darkness, I saw a film all of a sudden. 
My first reaction was, well, it could have nicer colors. That was my first reaction when I saw the film. I was also asking myself what this was all about anyway. What would happen now and what for? But I had to quickly realize that scenes came up in this film that concerned me, that had to do with me. You were also an actor in this film. Yes, I was also an actor. I was the protagonist, so to speak. Well, and for me, it was very important to experience this first scene where something was happening. Because it was very formative in this situation. I experienced a scene where I was teasing my sister, who was lying in her children's bed. And all of a sudden, there was a voice. It was a clear voice, a determined voice, but not a threatening voice that said, this was not okay. Well, what was not okay? I didn't actually hurt her. It was not okay. And it's unbelievable how many excuses we have when we do something that is not okay. We've got a thousand reasons why we did it. What was not okay? Was it about the motivation? Was it about the intention that was behind it? It was the intention behind it that was not okay. I wanted to tease her, and that was not okay. And eventually, I got to the point where I couldn't think of an excuse anymore, and then I was offered a choice. Either I admit that it wasn't okay, Maybe that's also got something to do with the upbringing or something along those lines. And the other alternative was that if it wasn't okay, I'd have to make it up somehow. So in this film of life, you mainly experienced things that needed to be resolved. Yes, that needed to be resolved. Actually, for me, all these things belong to the term reconciliation. They needed to be resolved. Otherwise, they would have remained open, unresolved. I couldn't make a decision. And then these two alternatives took on a life of their own. I'd almost like to call them creatures that took on a life of their own. It wasn't just one creature, but there were several creatures on both sides that were fighting for me. Every side wanted to win. Would you be able to name an example what kind of decision it was about? It was about whether I would accept that my actions were not okay, right? It was still about my sister, but this whole experience was extremely horrible for me. If you take hell, for example, you'd say, I've experienced hell. And those two camps were fighting for me. They almost tore me apart, and the whole game started over and over again. It didn't seem to stop, and if you'd ask me how many minutes this was taking, or even how many seconds, then I'd have to say that it was taking weeks. It was a completely different concept of time. Speaking of the intensity of the experience, Yes, speaking of the intensity of the experience. Yes, it seemed it was taking weeks. I can't say where from or by what, but eventually I was helped to make a decision because at one point I was ready to say that I wanted to make a decision. And somehow I got the feeling that I should make the decision and say, yes, it was not okay. To be honest. To be honest, just be honest. Well, on the other side, it was about time for reconciliation. It would have been a confession too, but it wasn't clear to me what I could still undo. I couldn't speak to my sister anymore and say, I'm sorry what I've done. In this long process of experiences, was it about several experiences or was it just about your sister? 
Well, those other experiences came later. But after I decided to give the answer that it was not okay, the whole game was over. Nobody had power over me anymore. I was free again. And at that moment, it became clear to me that it was about accepting one's life, one's situations and decisions the way they were. To accept oneself. Yes, apparently, it's incredibly difficult to accept oneself, to reconcile with oneself. So, in this darkness, it was about a purification process that forced you to see yourself as you were. Yes, to see myself as I am. You can even go a step further and phrase it more dramatically. The process is a process where you kill off your own pride. But it's on me whether I'm ready to kill it off or not. Yeah, and so have I then next year Erlebnisse gehabt. And so I had more experiences. I can remember one experience very well, where I stole five shillings from my mother. And for a split second, I thought, hopefully this won't be brought up as well. I don't want to experience this again. Because at the time I was stealing those five shillings, I was struggling with it. But I was still doing it. But this scene didn't come up. Why didn't it come up? Well, at that point, belief and religion started to play a big role for me. Well, to play a significant role. Apparently, it's possible that this reconciliation can be triggered by a consecrated representative, so to speak. I remembered something a lot later. It was a situation that I'd mentioned at confession, the sacrament of reconciliation. This means, in this film of life, you just saw situations that hadn't been reconciled. So it wasn't anything pleasant. Well, when people say the good deeds are counterbalanced with the bad deeds and so forth and so on, that's something I can't relate to. I can't tell you anything about that. Well, I've also got to say that I'm glad these good deeds are not presented because then it would have been harder to kill off one's pride. And at the end of this whole situation that I experienced and processed, actually, the rest of this process wasn't so hard for me anymore because from the first experiences I had, it was clear that I should just say yes. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. And then this complete darkness came back. And I can't really intuitively tell you, it took a while, but suddenly I saw a small bright dot in the far distance. It was smaller than a pinhead. It was a tiny dot. And this light dot, it was such a light dot, I was incredibly fascinated by it. It was clear to me that I wanted to go there, I wanted to get to this light. And was there a certain event that led to this moment when you could see this light dot? No, there was no event. I'd say it was just exactly like before, this process of reconciliation. And I was looking for something in this darkness. The thoughts were already there. Was that everything? This can't have been everything. Yes, these thoughts were there. Was that it? There must be some meaning behind it. At least I wanted there to be a meaning behind this whole thing. And that's when I saw this light dot. And when I saw this light dot, I realized immediately that I wanted to go there. No, even more. I was convinced that this was my home, my place of origin. This is where I came from, that's my home. And I was really cheerful when I realized that I could really go towards the light. Then I also noticed that I wasn't myself. There were others that were going towards the light too. I was also able to communicate with each of them. 
You're in a situation where you have a share of all the universal knowledge. There's nothing you cannot know. You ask yourself a question and you get an answer. In this situation, an important question for me was, I want to go to the light, indeed, but what happens when I get there? Will I cease to exist? Will I dissolve into the light? And the answer was clear, I'll always exist. You get an answer you can't doubt. As you mentioned earlier, that you used to be an altar boy and you were heavily influenced by your faith. As somebody who is religious, were the things you saw, were they like the heaven you'd always looked forward to longingly? Yes, it was the path to heaven. It was still the path to heaven. I made various experiences. Well, basically, I can only make indications, right? You encounter something else, let's call it soul, or a human soul. And you can... Well, you're just energy. You can go through things. You don't feel any resistance anymore. You can penetrate anything. I also got the impression I could although I can say, I don't want to claim that you've got the freedom to make contact with any person around the world whenever you want to. I've got my doubts whether it's really possible to control this yourself. But I made those experiences. I've also made those experiences in this world, in this state. For example, I had this experience that a scientist invented something that would happen in the future. That people would carry around the energy they need, no matter what for. They had carried it around at all times and it wasn't much bigger than an apple. And this scientist was devastated because something wasn't quite right. He was convinced that it had to work in a certain way. And well, I wanted to help him. I could have told him where the error was. From this state of being one with the universal knowledge. Yes, exactly. I knew it from being one with the whole universal knowledge and that's why I could tell him where the error was. I also wanted to show him the error. He had everything documented in a book that was almost bound. It wasn't like an actual file, it was more like a book. I tried to open up the page for him. Well, he just didn't want to read this page. So you got the impression that you were able to travel through space and time, through the light. Yes, I could also travel to the past, back hundreds, thousands of years. I can recall one situation in Japan where a village was almost extinct and I wanted to help them. Of course, there was also no chance to do that. In connection with these travels through space and time, there was also a particular event, an accident that you foresaw, which later on played a role for you too. Would you tell us more about that? Well, I just experienced that a family left their home by car. Well, it was a married couple with two children in eastern Tyrol. And a tree fell on a mountain road, or let's say, it wasn't falling anymore, but it was already lying there. However, according to my perception, it had just fallen earlier. And the father reacted badly, or he wanted to swerve, and by doing so, they were falling down a slope and the car overturned a few times and all of them died. And I could repeat this event as many times as I wanted to. Every time I tried to come up with something new in order to stop the accident from happening, like once, I swiped away the car key so they would have to look for it. At that moment, I was able to move matter. But it was no use. It always happened anyway. 
And my last attempt was to grab the steering wheel so the car would just crash into a tree. But no chance. The powers were not enough, or the powers of the father were a lot stronger than mine. How did you experience yourself? Were you still that 16-year-old boy with his personal story, or did you have the feeling you were an adult who had a widened consciousness? You're the first person who's asking me this, because I really had the feeling that I was truly grown up, mature I'd call it. And due to all these experiences, I felt expanded. Would you be able to describe this widening, this widening of your consciousness somehow? Well, about this extension, it's actually very difficult to explain this somehow. I can give it a try, or I can try it in order to help myself build something like an auxiliary bridge. So, if you asked me whether this heavenly state that became more and more intense the closer you got to the light, if you asked me whether this state was colorful or pure white, then I'd have to say it was both at the same time. And if you asked me whether there was absolute silence or whether you could perceive something, maybe a tune, then I'd have to say there was absolute silence and that there was a beautiful tune. No human being could write, and this was happening at the same time. Well, it was even more. I got the impression that I could be one of the keys of this tune that I could be a colored dot in this white landscape. It's like everything's connected by this intense connection. So you mean there was an experience of unity, but you were still yourself? Yes, exactly. This is what made it so thrilling, because I got the impression I was dissolving, but the me was still here. I paid attention to whether myself was still existent. Because there was the fear of losing this self. Fear is overstated. The feeling of fear doesn't exist anymore. You're wrapped in this very intense safety, so you can't get scared anymore. But curiosity is a driver. What caused you to stop going towards the light and turn around instead? Well, it was, I've got to say, it was a difficult situation for me. I was actually about to go into this light. It was as if I just needed to pull aside curtains or open a door. Although it wasn't solid. It was more like drawing back curtains. And then I heard a voice all of a sudden. It was actually the same voice and it said, go back into your body. No, that's out of the question, I said. And then there was silence. And I was busy with my statement. What am I doing here? I'm being shown something incredible, something beautiful, and now I'm saying, no, I want to enforce my own will. I'm destroying this because of my own selfishness. And I was struggling because I had a preview of how my life might continue, and that wasn't so much fun. I didn't really want to exchange it, and it was still my longing. It was my longing, my decision, not to destroy this incredible peace, this safety, this love, and to return. Although return, it somehow sounds like an order. No, it didn't sound like an order. 
It was a clear task. Yes, it was a task, a clear task. You're a religious person. The relationship to Jesus, to God, is very important to you. Which role did God and Jesus play during your experiences? Well, I can actually see a strong connection. I already saw it while receiving the sacraments. This sacrament of dying that I received all of a sudden, this pain, where this pain, the suffering, became meaningless, is a transfiguration that you experience. Well, it connected me to this transfiguration which Jesus himself also experienced at Mount Tabor. That's why I view this way to the cross a bit differently. Of course, he endured something incredible, this conquest, this mental conquest to endure it and not to fight back is enormous, it's inhuman. But I think that's where Jesus' biggest accomplishment lies. Because he could have used his power. If he really was God's son, why didn't he do it? That's a question you can ask yourself too. Because I've also got an answer here. Because we're Jesus' siblings in a different sense. That's what it's about, the incredible love relationship to turn into love and become free from every burden. We've got this chance. It's been prepared for us because he went that path for us. For me personally, he died on the cross because I can't make things right anymore. He made it right for me because I said, yes, what I did was wrong. In this sense, Jesus plays a huge role in my life. Did you have the feeling that you were accompanied by Jesus? I didn't have the feeling that I could take his hand, but it was clear to me that he was present. Especially during this life film, and in particular, during the first decision I made, it was not okay. I believe we're born so we don't make any mistakes. Sometimes, I suspect that we learn more from mistakes than from other situations. For me, it's just that life is about here. Its meaning is to mature for something higher, bigger, that we'd been before. How did you experience the return then, when you woke up in your ill body? Well, it was horrible. I immersed myself into my body and felt like being pierced by hundreds, thousands of swords. All the pain was back again. From a pure medical perspective, viewed from outside, what happened then? In the meantime, they'd already brought me to the death chamber. And when I realized that I was back in my body, so to speak, I thought there must be some sort of meaning that I should live in this world again. So maybe I should make myself noticed. But I couldn't make myself noticed. I didn't have a voice, I couldn't move. I was looking for something and couldn't find anything after trying three times. I already wanted to give up, but I thought, there must be a meaning behind this. Then I saw that there was a tag hanging on my toe. It was wrapped around my toe with a thread. And the tag said, Josef Atzmüller died on 20th of December at 8 p.m. Did you see your body from above or from the perspective of your body? I saw it out of my body, but I can't really tell because, actually, I couldn't open my eyes. Actually, I couldn't open my eyes. The same way I'd been able to perceive the visitors despite being unconscious, the same way it was possible for me to perceive everything now.
So you saw the tag on your toe from outside of your body? Yes, in order to be accurate, I'd have to say that it was from outside of my body. And then you started wiggling your toe? Yes, and I thought, if somebody's coming, I'm going to try that again. And indeed, a nurse or an auxiliary nurse came in. I don't exactly know who that woman was. In any case, she came in and I tried to wriggle my toe and the tag was shaking. She screamed and ran away. You were in the death chamber, declared dead. Yes, somehow this took a very long time for me until somebody came. I was already thinking that maybe she wouldn't say anything because she was ashamed that she had something to say, namely that somebody dead had moved. But then people came in, so obviously she must have come across as credible. And so they wheeled me out of the death chamber and back into my room. There was a doctor who had a very important question. One might think of many questions he could have had, but no, his question was, is the death certificate still in the house? That was the most important thing to him. The statistics have to be correct. Yes, the stats have to be correct. What an embarrassment if it had already arrived at the county council. In medicine, statistics is generally an important subject. This hasn't changed until today. Which medical explanations were given for your recovery? Well, this question is very interesting for me too, because it was like that. When I came back, I couldn't move at all. For me, that was the better condition. It got worse when I was able to move again, but why couldn't I do more? When my voice came back, why couldn't I speak anymore? And I don't know when I was able to read again. I had, I don't know how many hours it took me to read just one sentence. At the end, I was completely shocked, broken, because I didn't remember anymore what I had just read. And medicine, what did the field of medicine do? They let me lie there for a few days. Let's observe what's even going to happen. But there was no medical interventions anymore, no surgery. Well, 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 there were a few days after the Christmas holidays had passed. It was more towards the end of the year when they performed another surgery. They opened up the abdominal wall and realized that the inflammation was gone. And this chief physician, Dr. Peters, a die-hard atheist, just didn't want to believe it. He said, we did something really stupid. We're not able to tell anymore if somebody has an inflammation or not, and so on and so forth. He just doubted the diagnosis that had been done earlier. Other doctors said, we can only call this a wonder. We don't have an explanation for this. But this chief physician, Peters, also was a passionate surgeon. Shortly before this, he had set a world record in performing appendix surgeries. What kind of a world record was that? Performing 10 surgeries in 5 minutes? No, no. One surgery in 3 minutes. He set this world record in Paris. How did you cope with this near-death experience then? In the year 1964, the term near-death experience didn't exist yet. The pioneers of the research of dying, Kübler-Ross, Moody, hadn't published anything yet. What was this like for you? Were you able to speak to anybody about this? I would have wished for that. I've got to admit, my parents weren't willing to listen to me. They didn't want to know anything about it. Well, for my mother, the whole event was a totally shocking experience. Firstly, that I was supposed to be dead and yet I was still alive. It threw her completely off track. A few years later, she got mentally ill and even committed suicide later on. Was this connected to this experience? Yes, as well, but it also had to do with her childhood and with something else. And I also tried speaking to a priest about it. My mother had called this priest so I would tell him about my experiences, but he didn't want to know anything about it. During the course of your life, did you start doubting your experiences? 
Yes, it was difficult to cope with them. Nobody wants to listen to you. Well, and nobody wants to understand it. But I'd also say that's normal. Then I started developing a strategy of denial for myself. Everything's just imagined. It's all just in my head. What's this all for? It's not connected to anything real, and so forth and so on. And I was coping with that strategy quite well. It wasn't quite clear, but I was coping somehow, until September. I don't quite remember anymore. I was released from hospital on the 31st of January or in February. And at home, I was making progress rather quickly to relearn everything again. Because memories are stored, obviously. You just have to dig for them up again. All those things. And in September, I opened up a newspaper and read about an accident. And it hit me like lightning. This was the accident you saw back then. And for me, that was a disaster. I refused to believe that this could have been an accident. I was struggling with it. I was struggling with it even for a few years until the mayor of this town invited me and asked what was happening during this accident. And so I described the accident to him and what the family had with them in their car. Details that hadn't been in the newspapers, and he confirmed all of them. And I fell into a deep hole after this. I didn't want to speak and say anything about it ever again. Well, I wanted to hush it up. What were the details, for example, that you saw of this accident? Well, for example, the girl had a doll with her, but it wasn't wearing any clothes. It was a doll of a boy. And she always tried to stick the thumb, the hand of this boy, into his mouth. And then you could see that the hole, that there wasn't a hole, but that a hole had been made. And this could really be confirmed? Or I was able to describe the jewellery of the woman, the necklace, what the locket had looked like. Today you don't doubt the actuality of these events. Well, I can't doubt them anymore. I can't doubt. You had your near-death experience as a 16-year-old. And you were dealing with a lot of culpable, sinful behavior, also in connection with the meaning of confession. Older people who look back at their lives sometimes rather smile condescendingly at sins from their childhood or adolescence, because oftentimes they are waked against other things due to life experiences. Do you get the impression that you hung some things up too high, that you classified them as too significant? That if you had a near-death experience today, you would process other topics? Or do you think that right or wrong actions are set in stone, so to speak, no matter what life experiences you've had, that they should always be evaluated the same? Yes, I can speak with my own conviction. I think, as a child, I already did things where I had some scruples, whether they were good, right or not. I don't believe in that fairy tale that, that this is a small child. He or she doesn't know what she or he is doing. I don't believe in that. That's a myth for me. I think especially children have a good sense for what is right and wrong and permanently provoke. They test their boundaries and provoke, in order to extend their boundaries. But even the smallest children have a great feeling for what is right and wrong. You can experience that. Just ask children if what somebody's done was okay or not, and they'll clearly say yes or no. It's not about the event itself, but about the profound knowledge of what is right or wrong. Yes, of course. But small children have a great sense for that. It's something that adults lose eventually, and that gradually disappears. It's the sensitivity that gets lost, more and more. And I can't really tell whether it is worse to kill somebody or to tell something wrong about a person. One of them is character assassination and the other one is physical murder. Both are not okay. 
So when you think about your experience with the five shillings that you stole at the time, it's not about the offense itself, it's not about the value of five shillings, and it's also not about what its meaning would be today, but it's about the motivation behind it. Yes, it's not about the event, but how I deal with it. What is the motivation behind it, right? What's your attitude towards death today? Is it more like an attitude that you know what is going to come, or are you more open to it, curious about what will actually happen? You always ask those simple questions that are not so simple to answer. Well, one thing I can tell you for sure is, I am not afraid. It's part of life. Dying is part of life. I spent about 50 years longing for something almost every day. Sometimes it was more, sometimes less. That I would finally be allowed to die. Now God has put a wife by my side, so to speak. We weren't looking for each other, we didn't actually want each other, and still I'm in a relationship where I can say, okay, I can cope with it quite well, and if it lasts a few more years longer, that's okay. Still, I'm looking forward to the day the time has come. Sometimes I think, if it's just half as beautiful as I've already experienced it, I'll be content. Mr. Atzmüller, all the best for your future life, and thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.